Over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time talking about my favorite video game console, the Nintendo Entertainment System, and focusing on some of the more neglected games in its library. The majority of these titles that I describe as NES games no one played were released late in the console's lifespan, specifically the three years after the Super Nintendo was available in North America. While many of these games were kind of remarkable in how far they were able to push the graphical and auditory capabilities of the NES, others were doing the opposite, often looking worse than some of the early launch titles. Woof. More and more I started to realize that, hey, these were actually games developed for the Game Boy that were then altered slightly, colorized, and then repackaged for release on the technically superior Nintendo Entertainment System. In my recent video covering this subject, I highlighted 8 random games that I felt like fit this strange criteria. I thought that was all of them, but thanks to y'all throwing out more suggestions in the comments section, I was able to compile a list of many more of these weirdo conversions. Y'all rule! In this edition we're going to cover movie and television licensed titles, and as the quality for this genre is traditionally less than stellar, it will probably come as no great surprise that many of these Game Boy turned NES monsters fit that bill. As always with these list videos, I'm always scratching the surface of what a lot of these games have to offer, so maybe in the future I'll come back to some of them for a more in-depth look. Alright, let's get to it. Speaking of quality, here's a game that has absolutely none of it, Hook. To call Hook rough is putting it mildly. It's essentially a typical action platformer that places you in these small but confusing levels where it's never really clear where you're going or even what you can and cannot interact with. Worst of all is that not only is the hit detection abysmal, but this knife weapon is an all-time contestant for most useless attack. Even when you are right next to an enemy with their back turned to you, it's still more likely that you'll take damage before they will. How this ever passed any sort of playtesting is beyond me. The Game Boy version is exactly the same with a few graphical variations and, you know, less color. As this zoomed in handheld style makes the sprites much larger, I'd say this actually looks better than its NES kissing cousin, but not by much. I tried my hardest to make it through either game and either of the two opening stages, but I can barely play more than a few minutes before losing my patience and my mind. I will say though, this is one game where I actually enjoy watching my character die. Mostly because, yeah, it means I can stop playing it, but also because of this extremely prolonged death animation where Peter has to plummet all the way down through the entire stage. Amazing. Here's one that really threw me for a loop at first, Lethal Weapon. Honestly, not much to it. Kind of a straightforward single player beat em up where you can either shoot or kick a bunch of nameless goons and even do this mid-air river dance jump kick. Nailed it. The strangest thing is that you can play as either Riggs or Murtaugh, but only by walking off the left side of the screen, after which you'll appear as your police partner. What a weird design choice. The Game Boy version looks exactly the same except, hey, this isn't the level at the start of the NES game, what is this? Well, that's because Lethal Weapon on the Game Boy starts you off on the fourth level of the NES game, the Mall, meaning that the handheld version is missing all these jungle stages. And while on the surface these conjoined twins look very much alike, in the NES version enemies all die in one hit, while the Game Boy requires multiple attacks to kill any one of them. As lining bad guys up on this faux 3D setup is like playing rock paper scissors of whether you can hit them or not, the gameplay is of course incredibly tedious. The choice here is an easy one, and even though the presentation isn't much of an improvement, the NES lethal weapon is much faster and more fluid. WWF King of the Ring is the fourth and final WWF game on the NES, and the only one without WrestleMania in the title. There's a bunch of characters to choose from, all of whom have their own varying stats, which is, hey, that's a nice touch. Best of all, their in-game sprites kinda look like the wrestlers in real life, and in the case of Razor Ramon, even more like him than his goofy preview image. There's 1v1 and tag team options, along with the King of the Ring, but is the exact same thing but in a tournament format. Admittedly, wrestling games in the 80s and 90s were super simple in presentation and extremely repetitive in gameplay, and while King of the Ring is better than most, it does absolutely get real old real fast. The Game Boy version is exactly the same as far as the look of the characters and the controls, but there are a few changes. 
Aside from the usual differences, the crowd is way less defined here, and there are a couple of omissions from the select screen, including The Undertaker and Bam Bam Bigelow. This was another title that at first glance didn't immediately jump out to me as a Game Boy conversion, as I think the graphics are actually pretty good compared to the other WWF games on the NES. Jurassic Park is a game I didn't expect to meet this video's criteria, but man, does it ever. The basic premise is that you run around this park, collecting eggs and blasting these tiny dinosaurs with this oversized bazooka. Damn, dude. Overcompensating or what? Once you collect the eggs, one of the doors will open, which leads to a mini area. Find the eggs here, access the panel, head to another room, repeat the process, and eventually the main gate will open. The Game Boy version is a little simplified in terms of inventory items and sound effects, but the gameplay and graphics are identical. Oddly enough, I think I actually prefer the handheld take, as your character's speed is the same as the NES version, but the enemies move much slower. And as they're kind of hard to hit, this makes exploding them much easier. Jurassic Park was made by Ocean, who usually have a reputation for decent looking games with poor controls and kind of abrasive soundtracks. I will, however, give them props for this dinosaur in the intro. Sick. As simple as the gameplay is here, I kind of enjoy it. Sort of like playing a less confusing version of Fester's Quest. Now here's a game that really surprised me, Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Based on the 1991 Kevin Costner film, you play as Robin, navigating settings straight out of the film and battling soldiers as well as, well, lots of soldiers. The format is kind of interesting as there's Zelda style combat mixed with point and click style command prompts multiple characters that can join your party, and this human doll inventory system found in classic RPGs. There's even some fighting variety sprinkled in here, where you and your squad take on multiple enemies at once, and these goofy Errol Flynn style one-on-one -on -one fencing battles. It is a little clunky in every way, but there's a surprising variety to the gameplay, and the story is really in depth, with lots of dialogue and some dark scenes like Robin returning home to find his father crucified outside the castle brutal. As I've played this game a ton, I would have never guessed that the Game Boy version was identical. Man, this is pretty impressive, honestly. The handheld version is exactly the same, just with the usual changes like slower gameplay, smaller screen size, and of course, the grayscale. However, the color is really what makes the NES Robin Hood the superior port, as they actually make this plain game look more rich and vibrant than expected, and in the black and white Game Boy take, it can be a bit challenging to distinguish what can and can't be interacted with. Another game I absolutely wasn't expecting to fit this criteria was Star Wars. <laughs> no way! Well yeah, aside from some of the details in the cutscenes, these two Star Wars are exactly the same, even giving the land speeder this classic Game Boy outline. If you've never played it, Star Wars is one of those wander around kind of games where you explore the desert, enter some caves, hop about, and then... I have no idea. This game is extremely hard for all the wrong reasons, incorporating poor hit detection, awkward controls, and level formats where you never know what's below you as you perpetually yeet yourself onto the spikes. Also, there's no recovery time after getting hit, meaning you often get damaged in unavoidable life-ending bursts. Why even give Luke a life bar? Falling on these spikes means you're dead in two hits with no way to escape. I assume later levels showcase some X-Wings or lightsaber duels, but I can never make it more than a few minutes in Star Wars without getting frustrated and moving on. Which is unfortunate since... The sequel, Empire Strikes Back, also fits the bill. Yay. Aside from the cutscenes, some speed changes, and your Tauntaun's heavy breathing, yeah, these two games are absolutely cut from the same cloth. Empire starts where the film begins on the ice planet Hoth. You can jump on and off your animal and look around, kind of like the classic Blaster Master, but I actually think this game has more in common with the terrible Blaster Master clone, Metal Mech. Both games feature awkward jumping, multi-directional shooting that's impossible to aim, and some awful graphics and sound. The first level is just you and Tani falling endlessly through this cave that just goes on and on and on until... Uh, that's it. I'm a head out. Again, I'm sure there's some cool locations to come after, but if they play anything like this first level, nah, I'm good. Also, what is going on with the sound here? It kinda plays a few familiar notes from the soundtrack, followed by silence, followed by whatever this is. Wow, 
What a mess. Finally, let's talk about the other famous Star series with Star Trek The Next Generation. At first, this game confused the hell out of me. Just a chance to talk to your various officers, who give you an endless amount of status updates on the ship. <laughs> Man, that is so true to the source material. Then you can very awkwardly fly around and where the hell am I going? Turns out you need to talk to Data who will set your course for you. Oh, that actually makes sense. It's not like in the show Picard is just behind the wheel, spinning the Enterprise in circles like he's doing space donuts. After that, hmm. This is kind of a confusing game, which means if you're like me, you'll probably be consulting a walkthrough, at least until you get the hang of it. Turns out that each mission is randomly generated, and you'll need to journey to different sectors, command your crew to do various things, complete the mission, and then a new directive will appear. In theory, at least. I'm so terrible at this game that I've never completed a single mission. All I do is desperately try to find the enemy ship, and as soon as I spot it, they fly away and blast me repeatedly off screen. Looking at these graphics now, I can definitely catch the telltale signs of a Game Boy port, like these simple three-color portraits of the crew. And yeah, the Game Boy game is a match for sure, giving you every single option available in the NES and looking exactly the same. While I can't get myself into next generation at all, I will say that for what it is, the Game Boy original is actually pretty impressive. And that's it for now. There are many more Game Boy titles turned NES cast-offs to be discussed, so I'll be back in the future for part 3 at some point. If y'all can think of any that I haven't gone over, put them in the comments and I'll add them to the list. If you like my channel and want to see more, I'm making weekly bonus videos over at patreon.com slash words. I'm also streaming a different game every Thursday, 9pm Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube, so come hang. Until next time, thanks for watching.